our culture kind of feeds this idea that this is the best time ever to be alive, right? That um, things have been getting better and better all the time. And I think it's fair to say both of us think that's a kind of a lie that we've been fed by the culture. Um, when did you first, do you remember when you first, when this first kind of dawned on you that maybe the far distant past may not have been as brutish and terrible as we're told it is? Well, you know, my first intellectual passion was um, Native American cultures. When I was probably 11 or so, I, I think I read my first book um, talking about how I was growing up in Western Pennsylvania in the United States. And, and I remember reading a book about the Indian people who lived in that area and how they lived. And, um, and I just got obsessed with it. Um, and I, from 11 till probably, uh, you know, until girls really entered my world at 15 or 16, all I was interested in was Native American culture. So I read everything I could get my hands on. And of course, uh, if you immerse yourself in those sorts of books, it becomes pretty clear pretty early um, that, you know, in Cowboys and Indians, I always wanted to be the Indian, you know, it, it, there was uh, uh, something about the way they live. Now, of course, this was in the 70s. Um, there was a fair bit of romanticization going on um, of Native American people and cultures. Um, but I wasn't just reading sort of popularized stuff. I was reading anthropological studies. I was reading historical works like Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Uh, that was a very, very important book for me when I was probably 12 or 13. So I was uh, very familiar from a very young age with alternative viewpoints of certainly American history and manifest destiny and um the idea that just because one culture uh, is able to dominate another culture uh, militarily or economically doesn't mean that it's a better culture or that its people are any happier. And I remember reading a lot of anecdotal accounts of people in the colonial uh, America who ran away to live with the Indians. And until I started really researching Civilized to Death, I just thought those were sort of famous accounts because they were counterintuitive. And, you know, that's the sort of story that sticks in people's minds and stands out. Um, but then when I was researching Civilized to Death, I, I found that, in fact, there were laws in colonial America that prohibited uh, Europeans from running off to live with the Indians because so many of them were doing it that they had to actually pass laws. And uh, there are very few, if any, accounts of Native people willingly choosing to come and live in, um, you know, the colonial agricultural societies. Um, so, yeah, that, you know, getting back to your question, that that's really my first consciousness of it. So writing this book was very much sort of... Um, a closing of a, a big circuit in my life, I think. Right. Isn't, isn't there even the kind of um, example of the inverse where you talk about in the book where I think it was in an early kind of colonial exploration, um, some an indigenous person from the Americas was taken back to England and was introduced to the king and was dressed in kind of Western clothing. And and then they kind of thought, oh, like he, he won't go back to his, you know, his tribe right once. Uh, now that we've shown him all the wonders of civilization. And then as soon as they go past the islands again, he like takes off all the Western clothing, runs back to his community, right? And, and they're just kind of appalled. They're like, wait, what? Did you, you actually like living this way? You know, why, why isn't, why doesn't everyone agree our way's better? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's uh, those, the people you're referring to actually were from Tierra del Fuego and they were picked up by um, Captain Fitzroy, who was the captain of the Beagle on a previous voyage. And the idea was, as you describe it, the idea was quite uh, literally to bring them back to England, show them how amazing uh, British life was. Um, and then after they were indoctrinated into the British approach to life, to take them back so that they would 
tell all their people, hey, these British are amazing. They have a great way of living. We should help them and uh, really sign up for this uh, colonial project. And in fact, what happened was, as you described, the, the three of them just went right back to living as they had uh, abandoned the huts and the gardens that the British had built for them. And Darwin writes about them because he was on the ship with them all the way from England to Tierra del Fuego. So he knew them quite well. And um, they found one of them uh, named Jemmy and uh, brought him on the ship to have dinner. And Darwin writes in his journal that he had never seen such a, um, such a fall from, you know, the way Jemmy had been when they dropped him off, dressed up in, you know, his British clothes and all that, uh, to as he was now. Uh, it was really a, a tragic sight from Darwin's perspective. But Darwin wrote that he was happy at least to see that Jemmy still remembered how to use a knife and fork and, you know, eat properly at the table. <laughs> And they said to him, uh, you know, Jemmy, like, do you want to, you want us to take you back to England? You know, we'll, we can bring you back and you can live your life in England. And he said, no, 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 I don't want to. I want to stay here. And they said, well, why did you abandon the gardens that we made for you? And he said, why should I garden? There are plenty of birdies, plenty of fishies. Like the, the world is full of food. Why do you guys want me to work so hard? And you see the same kind of, incomprehension over and over and over this mutual incomprehension where the Europeans are saying, why don't you work? Why don't you grow food? Why don't you scratch the earth? And the native people are saying, why would you do that? You know, there's the famous story of the Kung San man in, in uh, present day Botswana and the Kalahari, same kind of conversation. And they're saying to him, why don't you farm? We're giving you tools. We're showing you how to do this. And he says, why should I farm when there's so many mongo mongo nuts in the world, right? Just doesn't make sense. And also a similar, more recent example where you describe a guy who, a documentary filmmaker, who's, who's filming with some indigenous people and then they want to come visit him. Is that, they visit him in England, I think? Yeah, Johnny Hughes. Uh, I think he was working for the BBC in Papua New Guinea um, and they spent quite a bit of time, I think several months, uh, way back in the, I think in the Belen Valley, which is quite remote and, um, you know, filming how people live there sort of, you know, quote unquote, stone age people. And, um, and at some point, some of the local people said to him, uh, Hey, you've seen how we live. Why don't you take us back and show us how you live? And, you know, everyone laughed at the time, but then later he thought, man, that would be a really interesting documentary, right? To bring them into the modern world. And he pitched the idea to his supervisors at the BBC and they said, yeah, well, we could pay for that. That's a great idea. So, of course, first he was really worried um, that they would come to England. And I think this was probably in the 80s or 90s. And he said um, that he was really afraid they'd come, you know, to the modern world and never want to go back because they'd see all the wonders and like, well, why should I go back and, you know, live in squalor um, when I could have all this? And he contacted a few anthropologists um, and without exception, the anthropologists sort of laughed at him and said, don't worry about that, man. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, people love, you know, the world that they're born into generally. And in any case, there's no uh, evidence that Native people would prefer our life. So they went ahead and, and brought these guys to England. And uh, I think they spent a few weeks. It's been it's been a while since I uh, have looked at the original you know, at Johnny Hughes's um, remarks. I think the main source of information, he's Johnny Hughes has written a couple of books, but I think he talks about this mostly was in a radio interview. Um, anyway, he, uh, he flies them out and they spent a couple months in the UK, took them around, showed them all sorts of things. Um, and he, he talks about this amazing breakfast uh, conversation one morning when uh, the guys were staying at the house of one of his producers and um, they were having breakfast and it was very early and, you know, a sort of typical 
dark British morning, probably raining outside. And, and the guy, the husband said, okay, well, you know, I've got to go to work now. And one of the, the native guys said, uh, why do you, where do you go all day? Because you leave before the light comes and you're back when it's dark again. Where are you all day? And he said, well, I'm working. I have to work, you know? And the guy said, what? Uh, why do you have to work so much? And he said, well, I have to pay for this house, for example. And the guy said, wow, okay, how many days do you have to work to pay for your house? And he explained the 30-year mortgage. And the, the, the native guys were just like, are you kidding? 30 years? When we need a house, we get together, we build a house in a couple of days. We have a house. That's it. 30 years. Incomprehensible. So, yeah, there are many examples of this sort of thing. When those guys went back to Papua New Guinea, of all of everything that they had seen in the modern world, the only thing that they wanted to take back with them to introduce into their culture was putting um, feathers on arrows. That really impressed them. I guess, I guess they had uh, visited an archery range and they saw the feathers on the arrows and they were like, now that's a good idea. That's something we can use. <laughs> right.